I'm Alice Loxton and I present documentaries over on History Hit TV. If you're passionate about all things history, sign up to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but just for history. We've got hours of ad-free documentaries about all aspects of the past. You can get a huge discount from History Hit TV. Make sure you check out the details below and use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY, all one word when you sign up. Now, on with the show. Over 2,000 years ago, the first great European capital cities rose around the shores of the Mediterranean. More and more people lived in increasingly crowded conditions. The arts, commerce and sciences flourished. Struggling for power and influence, these cities tried to outshine each other by erecting magnificent buildings. People from different cultures and parts of the world were drawn to these cities, seeking prosperity and happiness. Rome. During the second century AD, the Roman Empire was at its height and the city held a million inhabitants. No city was richer, more powerful or more ruthless. And none was so bloodthirsty. Monumental buildings testified to the power and greatness of the Roman Empire. Rome was the center of the ancient world. Rome, the eternal city with its eternal chaos. Even 2,000 years ago, the Romans complained about the noise and the traffic. Ox carts were prohibited from driving through the city during the day. Instead, they robbed people of sleep at night. The Colosseum was the largest arena of its time and could hold 50,000 spectators. When it was inaugurated in 80 AD, the festivities ran for 100 days. During the festival, 52,000 gladiators lost their lives. They demonstrated to people and emperor alike that only courage in the face of death would make you truly great and victorious. The capital of the Roman Empire was also the capital of crime. Murder, manslaughter and fraud were everyday events. On the streets of Rome, Drusus captain of the city cohort is in charge of law and order. He pursues murderers and thieves and unscrupulous traders such as Petronius, who are not above shady deals. To capture a crook like Petronius, Drusus slips into the Roman underworld. Harsh punishment awaits anyone who cheats the emperor. Right next to the Colosseum, archaeologists are excavating Imperial Rome. They are not interested in palaces and villas, but in simple buildings, the Rome of ordinary people such as Drusus and Petronius. These sites have been excavated before, but as the ruins held neither marble statues nor rich murals, the archaeologists weren't very interested and the sites were filled in again. But these days, Excavations have a different purpose. Archaeologists are trying to understand how people lived at the time. Gradually, the finds are pieced together to form a picture of everyday life, which was amazingly like life in a big modern city.
You have to look closely at the pieces to coax their story from them. This necklace is not made of precious jewels. It's simple costume jewelry. Perhaps it was a young man's gift to his beloved. German archaeologist Richard Neudecker is looking for signs of everyday life in antiquity. He's interested in these buildings, the insulae, the world's first large tenement blocks. They were four to seven stories high, some even higher. Living space was at a premium in Rome. Neudecker knows how this city once looked, what happened on its squares and in its alleys. Modern Rome was built on the debris of millennia. What was once the ground floor of this ancient tenement block now lies eight meters below ground. These rooms are almost 2,000 years old. They housed people who had come to Rome to seek their fortune. Alle Welt strebt nach Rom aus verschiedensten Gründen. Es gab natürlich angehende Dichter, Künstler, die in Rom Karriere machen wollten. Es gab aber auch die ganz große Schar der Armen aus Italien hauptsächlich, die gar keine andere Chance hatten, als in der Großstadt eine Arbeit zu finden, als Tagelöhner zu arbeiten, irgendwo reinzurutschen, ein Auskommen zu finden äh, von Tag zu Tag. Diese Möglichkeit hatte man auf dem Lande nicht. The lack of living space and the price of land forced people to live in narrow, cramped houses. They were dark and noisy and stank horribly. But the tenants were still forced to pay exorbitant rents. Mit Miete, mit Wohnungsbau war viel Geld zu machen. Es gab die Immobilienfirmen, die diese Gebäude schnell und billig errichteten, ohne auf Bauqualität zu achten. Es wurden hohe Mieten kassiert, die Risse in den Wänden wurden nicht repariert, wurden übertüncht und die Häuser stürzten sehr schnell ein. Für die Bauunternehmer war es kein großer Verlust, denn das Material war alles wieder zu verwenden, es war schnell wieder hochgezogen und die Mieteinnahmen flossen wieder. The poor had to share accommodation with strangers. Communities forged of necessity. The cityscape of ancient Rome had many such high-rise tenement blocks, separated by narrow alleys. This is the beat for Drusus and the men of the city cohort. They are Rome's policemen, respected and feared. Pater, my pater, we the military subvenientes. Drusus is heading for the market at Trajan's Forum. An informer has revealed that one of the traders has been watering the wine, which is routine but has also been cheating on the tax owed to the emperor. Drusus intends to find this villain and send him to the Colosseum as lion fodder. The history of Rome is written in blood. Legend has it that the city began with a crime, with the murder of a man by his brother. On the banks of the river Tiber, Rome was founded in 753 BC, says the legend. The tale begins with the Trojan hero Aeneas. His two descendants, Romulus and Remus, were abandoned on the banks of the river. The twins would have starved to death if they had not been adopted by a she-wolf. Later they quarreled over founding a city. Romulus killed his brother and named the new settlement after himself. In fact, Rome began as an Etruscan peasant village. 
The village grew to become the capital of a huge empire, extending from Britain to North Africa, from the Atlantic Ocean to the Black Sea. Wherever the Roman legions went, Roman builders erected splendid cities. Here, the elite of the conquered land, copying their Roman masters, lived in affluence. But in the city of Rome itself, everything was bigger and more impressive. The imperial palaces on the Palatine Hill. Here, life passed in luxury and extravagance. The Roman lifestyle set the example for the entire empire. But how could Rome afford all this? These shards reveal how Rome financed all this extravagant luxury. Rome was known as the City of the Seven Hills. Monte Testaccio was Rome's eighth hill. Jose Remasal has found it a rewarding excavation site for himself and his group of archaeologists. Rome produced prodigious quantities of waste. Monte Testaccio was nothing more than a gigantic tip. For the archaeologists, it's nothing but shards all the way down. In antiquity, millions of shattered amphoras were dumped here over a long period. With the contents of these amphoras, the provinces paid their tribute to the emperor. The vessels were filled with the provisions needed to feed the million people then living in Rome. The shards tell the history of Roman trade and of the tributes from the provinces and how the capital was supplied with food. Per il nostro lavoro eh, questo posto è molto importante perché qui si trovano queste anfore che mantengono ancora eh, le iscrizioni per dire alla moderna le etichette che hanno portato, cioè indicazione scritta con informazione molto complessa, sia la informazione del peso a vuoto del vaso, il peso del contenuto, il nome del commerciante, il controllo fiscale, il controllo che ha fatto lo Stato sul trasporto di questo materiale, che anche con la datazione consolare. Cioè abbiamo informazione precisa di chi ha portato queste anfora, di dove sono venute e in che anno. The archaeologists are working on a huge puzzle. The shapes of the fragments and their inscriptions revealed that most of the amphoras contained olive oil from the province of Hispania Baetica in southern Spain, today's Andalusia. Not far from Monte Testaccio were Rome's docks on the Tiber. Here, the amphoras were unloaded from cargo vessels. Directly behind the docks was the quarter where this endless stream of goods was stored. Some of the warehouses are still standing today, squeezed into the narrow space between the Tiber and modern Rome. The area is not open to the public, but Jose Remasal knows its importance. This is what remains of a vast trade center, which once supplied the city with all manner of goods. In these vaults, wholesalers stored grain, oil and wine and other commodities. Roma è una città molto grande nell'antichità, ma che si trova a una trentina di chilometri del mare. Dal mare, tramite il Tevere, sono stati portati e tutti i prodotti fino a qua e qua sono i grandi magazzini che 
dove è stato depositato e scaricato tutto quello materiale per vetovagliare tutta la città di Roma. Prodotti che venivano da tutte le regioni dell'impero romano, dall'Oriente fino all'Occidente, dalla Siria fino alla Spagna, dall'Inghilterra fino all'Egitto. From Spain came the popular garum, which most of us would find a bit on the nose. It was a fermented fish sauce that served as a spice for many Roman dishes. Workers repacked this expensive delicacy into smaller vessels for the retail trade. Wine amphoras were used over and over, but amphoras for oil were smashed. They would have been too hard to clean. This had to be very vivacious, because you have to think that the ships that came to the point were very small, that is, there had to be a lot of ships that came to the point of view. Qua erano scaricati con l'aiuto delle gru e i prodotti erano immagazzinati. But as trade and profits boomed, so did swindling, smuggling and fraud. These warehouses belong to Petronius. He deals in anything that can bring a profit, mostly oil and wine. But it's best not to ask too closely where he gets his goods. For some years now, Petronius has forced his clerk to fiddle the accounts and falsify documents. Prodi immortales! Quid scelleris commisi, et unter homines temem fortunis esse cogar! Vecchisite hic, ne astuta nestra un corregita! Prodi immortales! Petronius has no idea that Drusus is already closing in on him. Monte Testaccio is testimony to the fact that on rural estates, countless slaves worked till they dropped. Their labor enabled a small Roman upper class to lead the soft life. Roman tax officials rigorously controlled the flow of tax revenues. Most of what they recorded on wax tablets and sheets of papyrus has been lost forever. But valuable information about the tax system can be gained from Monte Testaccio's pottery shards. Questo monte è una mostra del potere di Roma. Viene considerato che tutte le anfore che sono state buttate qui sono la rappresentazione del potere di Roma, del tributo che hanno dovuto pagare le province. Anche, per esempio, al secolo XVIII è stato vietato di portare via i cocci di qua, perché alla fine sarebbe stato distrutto questo simbolo del potere di Roma. Un elaborato network di roads connette le province romane, ma la maggior parte del tributo è arrivato da sea. Olive oil and fish sauce from Spain, wine and grain from Sicily and North Africa. The province's tribute kept Rome viable. Exact accounts were recorded. Tax officials marked every amphora with their seal. The contents of each amphora were carefully noted so that nothing could be pilfered. For a long time, Petronius has been a thorn in the centurion's flesh. But until now, Drusus has lacked proof. Now Drusus has definite information. Someone has denounced Petronius for failing to pay tax. The seals on the amphoras give him away. 
Pius habet quam timuimus. Nilistorum convenit com tabulis publicis. Male erit tibi petroni. Petronius is caught red-handed. All he can do is flee. From Ostia, he could have left Rome forever. The city seaport was located 30 kilometers from the city gates. Docking at Ostia were ships from every corner of the Mediterranean, though some never reached their destination, as is shown by a sensational discovery in Pisa. Perhaps the port was already patrolled in antiquity, as it surely attracted anyone seeking to start a new life abroad. 2,000 years ago, Pisa was a Mediterranean port, just like Ostia. But today, Pisa is 10 kilometers inland. In 1998, construction workers discovered this Roman port during excavations for a new railway station. Pumps prevent the excavation site from flooding as the archaeologists have to work below groundwater level. The muddy ground kept the air away from the timbers, thus preserving entire Roman ships and their cargoes. This scavo um, fornisce molti molti dati in proposito ed è quello della quotidianità dei, della gente che viveva sulle navi dei, dei marinai. Sono soprattutto gli oggetti che queste persone utilizzavano che ehm, a mio parere sono molto importanti. Sono eh, gli zoccoli di legno, ehm, i cesti, le, l'abbigliamento di, di cuoio, eh, le spazzole che utilizzavano per pulire la nave e cose, cose di questo tipo. For the archaeologists, this discovery in Pisa was uniquely lucky. The conditions have rarely been so ideal for preserving materials such as wood that readily decay. Along with amphoras from the ship's cargo, the archaeologists discovered objects preserved in mud that had been found nowhere else. A piece of leather, perhaps from a sailor's kit. In the mud of the harbour, the archaeologists have begun to release the hull of another ship. They owe their discovery to a tragic accident. The ship must have reached port safely when it capsized and sank in a storm. In the boat's hold, the archaeologists found a brush, probably used by a young sailor to scrub the deck just before the storm hit. Once the ships have been cleaned, it's a race against time, as the timbers crumble when exposed to air. Engineers and archaeologists secure the hulls with a framework of steel. Through plastic pipes under a fiberglass covering, the wood is soaked with resin solution to preserve it. When this work is finished, the ships await transport to the museum workshops. Timbers and planks from the ships and the docks were also retrieved. Scarring indicates a ship may have rammed the dock in a storm and sunk before its cargo could be unloaded. È probabile che eh, nell'antichità, anche in, in età romana, sia stato tentato il recupero dei materiali che eh, sono naufragati nelle, insieme alle, alle barche. Però eh, io credo che eh, nel, il recupero dei materiali mh, sia 
stato reso molto difficile dal fatto che eh, le imbarcazioni, essendo naufragate per cause eh, naturali molto violente, sono state ricoperte dal fango e dai detriti e quindi <coughs> ripescare degli oggetti nel fango, anche se esistevano delle figure in un certo senso professionali che recuperavano oh, i materiali eh, sott'acqua. Most tribute payments were brought to Roman ships like these, the only way to transport such large loads. They delivered goods to all the big ports of the Roman Empire. The most important of these was Ostia, the port for Rome. But natural disaster must have overcome them. Their cargoes might have been intended for the market at Trajan's Forum in Rome. Richard Neudecker believes that the market played a special role in Roman life. Emperor Trajan ordered the construction of a trading center in the year 110 AD. It was a project so huge that part of one of the city's hills even had to be removed. 150 shops offered Romans whatever their hearts desired. Fresh vegetables from the region, wheat from North Africa, spices from Asia, the finest tableware, expensive cosmetics, and precious jewelry from distant provinces. Das Publikum hier war sicher gemischt, aber es war doch zum größten Teil aus den höheren Kreisen der Bevölkerung zusammengesetzt. Es waren die besseren, die feineren Leute, die hier einkauften. Die bewegten sich hier aber nicht allein auf der Straße, sondern sie hatten immer eine Menge an Gefolgschaft um sich. Sie wurden entweder auf der Sänfte getragen, da gab es also die Sänftenträger. Sie hatten Leute um sich, Sklaven, die ihnen den Weg frei machten. Sie hatten ihre Klientel, das heißt die von ihnen abhängigen Personen um sich. Je mehr jemand um sich hatte, umso besser, umso eindrucksvoller war es. On the ground floor were the shops. Those at the front were open to the street, but were shut with boards at night. To prevent theft and burglary, the markets were patrolled by guards. Here, a better class of shopkeepers leased their premises. It was a desirable area for a store, so the rents were probably high. The upper stories housed offices of the city administration. Here, poor people could register for free food. However, only male Romans enjoyed this privilege. Other Romans, who did not have to worry about surviving from day to day, could apply to have the public water supply connected to their homes. Es war niemals nur ein Platz, an dem man Dinge erledigte, seine Steuern bezahlte, einkaufte und wieder ging, sondern es war ein äh, sozialer Treffpunkt, es war ein gesellschaftlicher Treffpunkt. Man wusste, wann, zu welcher Zeit dort andere zu treffen waren. Man ging vormittags hierher und äh, fand sich dann mit anderen mit Bekannten, Freunden und so weiter zusammen äh, und wickelte ganz bestimmt auch Geschäfte ganz anderer Art dort ab, Geschäfte, die er immer auf der Straße im Freien unter Zeugen abgewickelt wurden. Es war sehr wichtig, dass immer Zeugen dabei waren. Man hat nicht den Vertrag aufgesetzt und unterschrieben, sondern man hat Zeugen gebraucht, die Öffentlichkeit. Die Öffentlichkeit ist ganz entscheidend für das Soziale, das Politische, das Geschäftsleben Roms. Such public areas were always extremely important to Roman society because life took place not indoors but on the street. This was true of all Roman cities. A tragedy has preserved one of them in its entirety, Pompeii. Pompeii lies at the foot of Mount Vesuvius, one of the world's most dangerous and unpredictable volcanoes. No one knows when Vesuvius will erupt again, but three million people still live in the shadow of the volcano.
British archaeologist Rick Jones came to Pompeii to research how a Roman city functioned in antiquity. Our Anglo-American project in Pompeii is trying to study how the city that was destroyed in AD 79 came to be like that. How the whole mix of big houses, of rich and poor, of medium-sized houses, of workshops and bars came to be created over a period of some several centuries, maybe five centuries, and to examine that within the space of one complete block of the city. Pompeii was a small city set in the countryside amid gardens and vineyards. Still, many aspects of day-to-day -day existence must have been similar to those in Rome, so Pompeii can serve as a model of life in every Roman city. Pompeii is a time machine, which will take you on a journey into the Roman past. Nowhere else is the everyday life of ancient times so palpable. The city's last day was virtually frozen in mid-action. In the year 79 AD, Mount Vesuvius broke apart spat fire, rained ashes, and obliterated the city. The colonnade of a luxurious villa. The head of this family ran a bakery. These millstones ground grain into fine, expensive flour, or into coarse flour, considered good enough for the poor and the slaves. The stable with the animals that turned the millstones. They perished in the hot and poisonous gases, as did all those who could not flee the city in time. Generations of archaeologists have excavated Pompeii, but there are still new discoveries to be made. With the help of more than a hundred staff, Rick Jones is currently exploring a whole block of Pompeii. Their common goal is to reconstruct life as it once was in this ancient city. These are the remains of an evening meal at which wild boar was served. But only wealthy households had kitchens with their own stove. The poor bought their meals on the street or in cheap taverns. There were hundreds of these taverns in ancient Rome. Congregating there were denizens of the underworld and those with nothing more to lose, least of all their good name. <laughs> Petronius cannot return home because the police are after him, so he has come here, believing he will be safe. Who are you in this, Now Petronius has made enemies, but someone on the run from the city cohort can't afford to make enemies. Previous excavations in Pompeii concentrated primarily on its last day. But now, scientists are digging deeper to find out more about the ways the city evolved. The houses were continually rebuilt, changing over time like the people. The archaeologists are searching specifically for small items. 
The surgeon's house was first excavated in 1926. His surgical instruments were given to a museum long ago. Now the history of the building and the changes in society are being examined more closely. What we're finding is that the, the rich, in simple terms, got richer and the poor got poorer. We see a process by which the, um, the bigger houses got bigger, more luxurious, more well-appointed with mosaics and fountains, whereas the poor are squeezed into smaller spaces, into upstairs spaces, into tighter places all round, whether within the big house as the servants and slaves or within the bars. Below the street, archaeologists uncover a lead pipe which brought fresh spring water to public fountains and to some villas. But only wealthy households were connected to this water supply. The masses of slaves enjoyed none of the luxuries typical of the Roman lifestyle. Roman cities functioned because slaves did the heavy work and because Roman engineers devised technologies which made life more comfortable. The houses of the rich had running water, bathrooms and underfloor heating. But much greater demands were placed on builders and city planners in Rome than in Pompeii. People who lived in Rome suffered from the problems of any big city, the sheer scale of it is something that is only really paralleled in modern times. And so they had many of the problems of congestion, of expensive accommodation, of difficulties of sleeping at night because of the noise, all those things that, that were, uh, would go with people being crammed together in a, in a tight urban space. Rome was greedy for water. Drinking water for private and public wells water for decorative fountains in upper-class houses, and water for the numerous public baths. Eight aqueducts brought millions of litres of water into the city every day. The arch was a Roman invention, as was cement. It was these lightweight arches that made the aqueducts possible. But eventually, even the finest spring water ends its run as stinking sewage. The stench pervaded all of Rome, even the Forum Romanum. Here, there were temples honoring the gods. Here, the Senate conferred and created policies, and high society used to meet. At the Forum Romanum is the entrance to the city's underworld. Today is closed to tourists. The famous Cloaca Maxima. All of Rome's sewage, both the refuse and the human waste, flowed through here. More than 2,000 years ago, Rome already had a sewerage system. Nevertheless, large quantities of sewage and rubbish ended up in the streets. Back then, Oil lamps burned in the niches of these dark tunnels. They provided a feeble light for the work of maintenance crews. The sewers frequently blocked and had to be cleaned regularly. 600 meters of the Coaca Maxima are still part of today's system. In spite of its aqueducts and sewerage system, Rome suffered from a lack of hygiene. Es war äh, nicht äh, so gesund in Rom zu leben. Das lag, äh, da mag man sich wundern, aber es lag sehr stark am Wasser. Denn die Aquädukte, die zahlreichen Aquädukte versorgten natürlich nicht die kleinen Haushalte. Äh, der Norma das normale Wasser, das man brauchte, das man trank, stammte aus dem Tiber. In den Tiber flossen auch die Kloaken. Das heißt, es war natürlich ein ständiger Teufelskreis. Krankheiten wie Typhus und so weiter waren sicher an der Tagesordnung. Und es kommt eine weitere äh, Gefahrenquelle hinzu. Äh, das war der Schmutz, der Dreck, der in der, der Staub, der in der Luft lag. Augenerkrankungen waren sehr, sehr häufig, sehr zahlreich. So the city's water supply was also a source of disease. 
This was centuries before organisms were known to cause disease, so people resorted to home remedies. Cabbage, for instance, was said to be a cure, even for cancer. The durchschnittliche Lebenserwartung wird meistens so bei knapp 30 Jahren angesetzt, bei Frauen entsprechend niedriger, weil Frauen sehr oft natürlich bei der Geburt starben. Das sagt natürlich nicht viel aus, das heißt nicht, dass man, wenn man die 30 erreicht hatte, automatisch damit rechnen muss. Das heißt nur, dass natürlich sehr, sehr viele schon sehr früh starben, Kinder starben sehr viel. Wenn man das Schlimmste überstanden hatte und in einigermaßen geordneten Verhältnissen lebte, dann wurde so ein Römer auch 60 Jahre alt. Dann war er aber wirklich ein alter Mann und verbraucht. The health centers of Roman cities were the hot spring baths. Only wealthy Romans could afford doctors. Most came from Greece, like Galen. He started his Roman career as doctor to the gladiators and later became the emperor's personal physician. Many Romans had already finished work by lunchtime and spent the rest of the afternoon at the baths. They practiced sports, enjoyed the baths or had a massage. Here they were able to leave the dusty streets and hectic pace of city life behind. The Roman Museum of Archaeology houses the largest collection of artworks and everyday objects from ancient Rome. In the laboratories, specialists work tirelessly to preserve this heritage. The marble for these statues often came from far away, some of it from North Africa. Wealthy Romans commissioned these works to decorate their homes. But it was not the artists and artisans who were admired, it was the buyers. Beautiful objects gave the owners a higher social status and they enjoyed flaunting it. Everything can be found in the museum storerooms, from the simplest objects for daily use to magnificent artifacts from the Emperor's palace. These objects are eloquent about the city's splendor, but also about people whose lives were spent in the shadows. I diversi materiali che le differenti classi sociali potevano disporre nella Roma d'età imperiale erano determinati dalla disponibilità economica che queste classi potevano avere. Pertanto, per quanto concerne l'illuminazione, noi possiamo avere una casistica abbastanza esemplificativa. Per esempio, per le classi più elevate, noi abbiamo lucerne di bronzo, come questa che stiamo mostrando. Per le classi medie, invece, possiamo trovare lucerne invetriate, cioè di ceramica ricoperte da vetro, in tutto e per tutto simili a quelle di bronzo, però non di metallo. In ultimo, per le classi più povere, noi abbiamo esemplificazioni di eh, lucerne in terracotte prive di rivestimento. The Romans were fond of surrounding themselves with beautiful things. Even objects for daily use were created with an artistic sense. The humblest cooking utensils were decorated. Money. Everyone in Rome knew that anything could be bought with money. Even votes and official positions, traitors and informers. Rome never slept. Night was the time for delivering everything which would be needed the following day. But those who moved through Rome's dark streets at night had to be wary, and not just of gangs of robbers. Hey,
Drusus knows that arresting Petronius is only a question of time and money. Among the last drinkers, the arrest causes only a slight stir. But for Petronius, it is the beginning of a nightmare from which there will be no awakening. The Colosseum. Above was the arena. Down here stretches a labyrinth of narrow alleys and tiny chambers. Until recently, not all their functions were known. The architectural historian, Heinz Jürgen Bester, has studied this complex minutely. He has concluded that the structures beneath the floor of the arena were part of an elaborate stage machinery that could suddenly release starving lions, panthers and tigers into the arena. With more than 100 performances per year, the Colosseum had to come up with more and more sensational acts to keep the public interested. Die heute leeren Amphitheatergänge hier im Untergeschoss müssen wir uns vorstellen mit einem Aufzugssystem gefüllt, was es eben ermöglichte, den Spielbetrieb in der Arena vom Untergeschoss in die Arena zu bringen, um dort einen exakten Spielablauf zu gewähren. What appeared miraculous to the spectators was really hard work performed by a skilled stage crew below the arena's wooden floor. While the crowds roared in their seats above, teams of soldiers, slaves and animal tamers were busy below running the stage machinery. Nowhere else could Romans get so close to their emperor. For him, the behavior of the crowds was a barometer of public sentiment. At times, he could even be booed. People and emperor watched the same spectacle. Despite the cruelty of combatants being stabbed or mauled to death for the audience, it was merely another entertainment. In den Rängen, die nicht für besondere Staatsgäste vorgesehen war, wo das allgemeine Volk saß, wurde sich Essen mitgebracht. Man aß entweder bei den Spielen oder in den Pausen. Erfrischungen konnte man eben auch an gewissen Ständen im Inneren des Kolosseums kaufen. Und eben, was auch hier die Grabung gezeigt haben, sind dementsprechend die Abfallstoffe, Kerne, Nussschalen, Pfirsichkerne, Kirschkerne bis hier runter in das Untergeschoss geschwemmt worden. Fifty-thousand people enjoyed watching men and women fight for their lives. Petronius has cheated the emperor and can expect no mercy. With murderers and temple robbers, he waits to make his entrance. With their bare hands, these hapless prisoners must fight lions and bears for public amusement. Many gladiators were highly trained professional fighters who could achieve recognition and even wealth. Some of them became celebrated stars, adored by a fanatical public. That is, as long as they manage to stay alive. Oh. Oh. 
At the Colosseum, the law was kill or be killed. Salve, glory moment. Such as Plackett. Captain Drusus does not want to miss this spectacle, especially as it's his day off. He's looking forward to exciting games and unforgettable fights that will be talked about for days. Not unlike sporting events in today's world. But there was some criticism as well. This is how the philosopher and politician Seneca condemned it. Man, once sacred to his own kind, is now murdered for amusement as if it were a game. People find the killing of one man at the hands of another a welcome spectacle. Visitors from all the provinces gathered at the world's largest arena to see the famous gladiators fight each other. Rome was mighty and it was merciless. The Roman Empire lasted a thousand years. Its center was the great city of Rome. With all the advantages of big city life, there were problems as well. The first city in history with a million inhabitants struggled with problems such as traffic congestion, housing shortages, and crime. Problems which routinely appear where a great number of people live together. They existed then as they do now, and they will most likely exist in the future.